for those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, Scotty Burge. I'm not from around here. Um, I, I was born in the UK. I did 25 years flying in the Royal Air Force before I moved over here. I flew uh, tornadoes. I flew maritime patrol. I was an instructor. In my day job, I'm an FAA inspector. You can talk to me. It's okay. Um, but if you have any problems, the FAA, we, uh, these days, we're all about openness and we're not out to take your certificates. We're after compliance now. So if you... No, it's true. It's true. I, I was not a believer either, but I've, I've done the course now and I've drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, so if you do have any problems, please give me a call. You know, we are there to help and I'm certainly there to help you all. What I want to talk about today is stall spin accidents, which, you know, I'm sure you've all been through all this stuff before. However, it's still a big issue for us. Stall spin accidents are a major issue in the US. So let's have a little look at them. If you kill the lights at the back, please. So we'll look at stall spin statistics. A little bit, you can't do anything these days without looking at the statistical analysis first. We'll have a look at what causes stalls and spins. It sounds obvious, but the number of people that have either forgotten or never been taught properly, what causes them? types of spins. Now, we all know we go spinning in the CAP airplanes all the time. So, we do, because most of us have never spun or spun a long time ago, it's important that we learn a little bit about that. We'll look at the stall spin scenarios. Why do people get into spins so often? We'll have a look at accident signatures. So, when I go out to an accident, why do I know it was probably caused by a spin? And then we'll have a quick look at a case study at the end. For those of you who can read it, have a quick look at that. Stalling at, the, at, at its best. So, stall spin t statistics. 15% of all accidents are stall spin accidents. However, 20% of those accidents are fatal. Or, uh, of all accidents are fatal. 25% of G -ax GA accidents are fatal, but a third of stall spin are fatal. So more often than not, they're going to be fatal for us. Statistical purposes, as far as we're concerned, there's no difference between stalls and spins. Why not? Why don't we differentiate them? Well, what causes a spin? Stall. So they're all stall accidents, effectively. Yeah, but it's still a stall. And some aircraft are more prone to stall spin accidents than others. Any idea what's one of the biggest ones? Gliders. Gliders, because, of course, they, they, don't, they don't have the, uh, the added benefit of an engine. This one was an interesting one. Believe it or not, if you can see that one there, you can just see the pilot, you see the nose disintegrating. He actually walked away from that. Yeah. Unbelievable. I don't know if that says something about his flying or the way that the glider was built, but he walked away from it. So, design effects on stalls. Different aeroplanes are going to stall differently. So, wing platform, whether it's a straight wing, swept wing, elliptical wings, all those different wing platforms do have different stall characteristics. Now, the Cessna wing, straight wing, why do we pick the, 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 the straight wing? What is it about the stall characteristics that are better for us? Where does it stall first? The wing route. Why is that important? Controllability, controllability yeah, because we, ne we need to keep controllability of the airplane all the way into the stall. Okay? So some of the designs are going to stall from the route out or tips in. The airplane aerofoil shape is going to matter. So is it a symmetrical shape, uh, like you're going to get in an extra 300? Is it cambered and all the rest of it? There's some, some ones there. And then other things, dihedral and anhedral. Dihedral is going to increase the stability and improve the stall characteristics. Anhedral is going to decrease the stall characteristics. Anhedral is going to reduce the, the, the stability and make the stall a little bit less controllable. Canards. Canards are a great idea. The Wright brothers got it right. Why is that? Why are canards so great? What's the angle of attack of the canard like compared to the angle of attack of the wing? If you put that little wing at the front and you just make the angle of attack just a little bit more than the wing, What's going to stall first, the canard or the wing? The canard. So the canard stalls first, the nose comes down. The main, the main wing never stalls. So actually the Wright brothers got it right. And then engine configuration. You go and fly some of these seaplanes with a big engine mounted overhead, they're going to give you problems as well. So <clears throat> this one. Altitude loss in a spin recovery is a lot greater than a stall recovery. If you didn't know that, leave your pilot certificate on the table on the way out, please. 93% of all stall accidents start at or below 
pattern altitude, and as Doc said before, in day VMC. Just think about that. A thousand feet or less, 93% of them. Anyone want to go spinning at a thousand feet? I don't. This is the scary one here, look. 40% happen at less than 250 feet. Can you recover from a spin at 250 feet? No, that's why they're accidents and not statistics. Okay. Stall spin statistics. So single engine, fixed gear is most likely to stall spin. One of the reasons is there's more than, of those than anything else. But what's the other reason? Exactly, because those that's what student pilots fly. However, the student and the ATP are the least likely to get into stall spin accidents. What do you think one of the most likely is? Say again? Overconfidence. Overconfidence. What type of person? The one particular that actually has more stall spin accidents than anybody else. Brand new certificated flight instructors. Brand new certificated flight instructors. Because they've got that little bit of confidence, but they've still only got 250 or 300 hours. Can somebody head her off before she can? <laughs> okay. Daddy, here you go. I'm good. I'm good. But I'm good. You can take it back. No, I'm good. Thank you. You take it. Bye. You can tell they're very, very shy kids. Um, so, yeah, students and ATPs. ATPs are least, uh, least likely to get into a spin. They're, they're professionals. They're flying every day, uh, you know, CFIs are flying every day, but they don't have the hours to back it up. 41% of all spin accidents are during maneuvering flight. Well, what do we mean by maneuvering flight? Maneuvering flight, okay? It's outside of those other phases, outside of takeoff, uh, descents, approach, climb, cruise, and go-arounds. But a lot of the time, it's when we're maneuvering in the pattern. So what's the, what's the biggest killer? Base to final, yeah, with the, with the, follow, with the, with the, uh, with the, the closing wind. We'll talk about that more in a minute. What causes a stall? Well, for those that can't remember back to when they learned to fly, we'll take a quick gander through again. So here we go. There's your normal angle of attack there. The angle between the relative wind, which is a t phrase I hate, relative airflow is better, but relative wind and the, and the, the mean cord line of the, of the wing. Okay? As we increase that angle of attack, we start to get disturbance over the back of the wing to the point where the wing no longer flies. We reach a point the wing can't support the lift and the wing stalls. So as we increase the angle of attack, our lift increases all the way up to the stall. Note the stall is not a break point, it's a curve. Okay? So the, the wing will always still, it'll still continue to produce some lift even into the stall. This is one of the biggest things. When, we, when we're taught stalls, a lot of us are taught very badly. We're taught by instructors who, well, it's on the syllabus, I've got to teach you how to stall the aeroplane. Well, no, you don't. What you really should be doing is teaching us to recognize that the airplane is going to stall and prevent it from happening. That's the, the important bit. If the student gets to the point in the pattern that they've actually stalled, that's kind of too late. We should have recovered well before that. So when I teach, this is what I teach, signs of the approaching stall. There are four of them. Decreasing speed. Sounds obvious, but you're going to see that in a couple of ways. One is you're going to see the airspeed indicator reducing. How else are you going to notice the speed washing off? Sound. Decreasing noise, yeah. So you're going to get that noise starting to wash off as well. What about the uh, controls? They're going to start to feel pretty sloppy. And what about the nose position? Where's the nose reference to the normal nose position? It's higher. Now, it's not necessarily a high nose, but it's higher than the normal nose position because we can stall the airplane in any attitude. Okay and at any speed, but if those, those four, higher than normal those attitude, are signs of the approaching stall. If we recognize one of those and we start to do something about it, we've actually achieved our main goal, which is to prevent the stall happening. Signs of the developed stall, give me one. How do we know the airplane is stalled? Buffet. Airframe buffet, okay? So that's the airflow breaking up over the wing. Give me another one. Who said stall warning horn? Does the stall warning horn ever break? Is it always serviceable in the airplane? How do we know? So the stall warning horn is a great aid to recognize it. But when's the stall warning horn meant to go off? At the stall? Between five and ten knots ahead of the stall. And they don't always work. I've flown airplanes when the stall warning hasn't worked. So I never teach 
to use a store warning horn as a, a sign of the store. If it goes off, that's great, it's a bonus, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the aerodynamic reasons the aeroplane is stalling, because that's never going to lie to us. So airframe buffer. Despite the fact that the aeroplanes are well made, and we're obviously flying it perfectly with a ball in the middle, the aeroplane may get a wing drop. So one wing may stall just ahead of the aeroplane, uh, ahead of the other one, so we may get a wing drop. The yoke's going to be held back, the elevator's full back, but is the nose going to stay back? No. no. So we're going to get, the nose is going to drop, despite the fact we've got up elevator. And what about the rate of climb and descent? What's that, that going to show? VSI is going to show a high rate of descent. Any one of those is going to indicate the stall. We don't need all four, any one. Buffet, wing drop, nose drop, or that, that undemanded high rate of descent. Any one of those can show us that we're stalled. So when we teach, what I'm going to teach mainly is the signs of the approaching stall. That's what I want the student to recognize, that we're getting close to the stall. Do something about it then. If the aircraft's already stalled, yes, we need to teach the student how to get out of it. So how do we do that? Well, what's the standard stall recovery, folks? So what's the, what's the most important thing? Lower the nose. Power's a bonus. Gliders stall but we can recover a stall from a glider without any power. Most important thing is to remember why the wing is stalled. It's stalled because we've exceeded the critical angle of attack. The only way to recover from a stall is to reduce the angle of attack. Okay? So, elevator forward to unstall the wing. Simultaneously, apply full power. It does two things for us, actually. First thing is it gives us more prop wash, so it gives us more airflow over the wing. What else does it do? It's going to reduce that height loss. Okay? So one of the things that we've always got to think about when we're teaching students or, or you're out practicing these yourself, always think worst case scenario. You've stalled close to the ground. We want to minimize the height loss and get back away from the ground as quickly as possible. So that's why we simultaneously apply full power. Aileron's neutral throughout the stall. And it doesn't matter whether we're stalling in the turn, stalling in the climb, approach configuration, whatever. Keep the ailerons neutral. Why? If the wings drop, shouldn't we pick the aileron up? Adverse your potentially, but when you use the ailerons, what, does, what are you doing to that wing? You are affecting the airflow because you're adding drag and you're increasing the angle. If you put the aileron down, all you're doing is increasing the angle of attack on that part of the wing. Well, if you're increasing the angle of attack, all it's going to do is keep the wing stalled. So you're going to delay recovery. Okay? So any time that you, you stall the airplane, aileron's neutral. And that's one of the biggest failing points I see with students is they always want to pick the wing up with aileron. It's natural, because that's what we do, isn't it? We pick the wing up with ailerons all the time. If you have to pick the, up, uh, the wing up, you can use a little bit of rudder. But the best thing to do is keep the ailerons neutral as we recover. Now, once you've got flying speed back, the wing is unstalled, then you're going to level the wings, return to the desired attitude, and clean the airplane up. Okay? Again, one thing people forget to do when you're doing stalls in the, in the approach configuration, they kind of do the stall, recovering, oh, thank God, I'm finished. And they forget to clean up. No, get rid of all the drag. Let's get the airplane climbing away from the ground. We've just stalled close to the ground. So make sure we get rid of all the drag. Okay? So that stalls. What causes a spin then? Because we said before, it's just... Yeah, so we need two things for a spin to happen. We need that and that. So we need to be stalled, and we need to be yawing the aeroplane. So we need some form of yaw, okay? And it, it does result in auto-rotation. For those helicopter pilots in the room, I apologize. It's the right use of the word, okay? So that for, you don't really need to be able to see all the wording here, but this is a, a diagram of the, the spin. There's really three distinct phases. The incipient phase can last between one to two turns, and that's as the aeroplane starts to stabilize into a spin. The fully developed spin, that's when it's stabilized, okay? And you can, it'll hold that, and it's not going to change its, its configuration or attitude. It, it's a stable rotation rate all the way down. And the recovery, normally between half to one full turn, okay? The recovery phase. So the incipient phase, the fully developed, and the recovery phase. And we'll have a little bit look, a look at that in a, a little bit more in a sec. There's three types of spins. I mean, there's a few more, but three main types. Somebody give me one. An inverted spin? Absolutely. So what's the opposite of an inverted spin? Erect. <laughs> yeah. The erect spin, the inverted spin, and then the one that killed Goose in Top Gun, what was that one? A flat spin. Okay. So those are the three types of spins. The biggest thing really is 
In a rec spin, the roll and the yaw are in the same direction. An inverted spin, exactly the same, but this time the roll and the yaw are in opposite directions. And finally the flat spin, and that's the one we're going to spend a little bit of time on in a sec, because flat spins kill people in Cessnas. The rec spin. So let's see if you can recognize all the phases of the stall. Slowing down, decreasing speed, decreasing noise, sloppy controls, higher than normal nose attitude. And just before he stalls, he's going to apply full pro spin controls and the aeroplane will spin. Anytime you're ready. There we go. Now this is the incipient phase. It's developing into the stable spin. Still not stable. Now it's stable. Watch. So same kind of rotation rate, that's a stable spin. And the recovery stage takes about one, one full turn to recover. There you go, there's the recovery there, and it pitches out. Okay, so that's the erect spin. Any questions on that one? So spin recovery. That's obviously one thing we've got to know about. It's all very well getting into a spin. Spin recovery. Now this is a key one that lots of people don't know. If you get a sign of auto rotation, the first thing we're going to do is centralize the controls. Okay? Nine times out of ten, in fact more than that, 95 times out of 100, that is going to prevent the spin from happening. So, as a, as a, how many CFIs have we got in the room? A few of us? So, CFIs, when is the time that students are most likely to put you into a spin? What maneuver? Which type of stall? Power on stall. Absolutely, power on stall. I think every time I've had a student try and put me in a spin, it's been on up through a power on stall. Okay. However, if you don't believe me, go and have a look at it in, in, your, in a non-cap aeroplane, but go and apply full pro spin controls, and then as soon as you get auto rotation, centralize the controls. 99 times out of 100, the aeroplane will not spin. It'll put you in an unusual attitude. That's okay. We can recover from unusual attitudes easily but the aeroplane will not spin. So the first sign of any undemanded roll, centralize everything. If it continues into a spin, then we're going to apply the standard spin recovery, which is what? Yeah, pair, P-A-R-E, okay? So, power to idle. Well, hang on, we said the stall recovery, we want to go full power, so why do we bring the power to idle in the spin? Why? Yeah. Yours one thing? Acceleration. acceleration. The other thing, as we add power, what does it do to the nose? If you add power, what does the nose do? Yeah, well that increases the angle of attack, doesn't it? So it's going to reduce the chances of us recovering from the spin. So keep the power to idle. Okay. Ailerons, neutral. Well, we've already mentioned this with the stall. Same thing here. When I teach uh, um, spinning, I'll teach and I'll demonstrate with, with pro-spin aileron and anti-spin aileron. So that's in-spin and out-spin aileron. And they just, all it does is delay the recovery of the spin. That's all that happens. It's not going to help you at all. So the ailerons must be neutral. Rudder, opposite the spin direction. Okay. Why, do we, why is that important? Because that's the thing that's, yeah, that's the thing that's actually going to reduce the spin, isn't it? Yeah. And then the last thing. Yeah, because I couldn't answer my phone, sorry. Uh, oh, that's all right. Elevator forward. Why is the elevator going to go forward? Why? Yeah, to reduce the angle of attack. Why did we spin in the first place? Because the airplane was stalled. Okay. So the elevator's got to go forward. Now, once all that's done, where's the airplane going to be? <laughs> Could be in any kind of attitude, okay? So at that point, then we're going to recover from the unusual attitude. Again, this is where people get things wrong. There we are. We're inverted in a nose-down position. What are we going to do? Don't just pull to the horizon. And you'd be amazed the number of people that want to do that. Roll to the nearest horizon first. Roll to the horizon and pitch out. Okay? Always. Any questions on the spin recovery? Great. Let's have a look at the inverted spin then. Completes his lookout.
Get that stall going. Comes all the way forward into perfect. And almost. Okay. Now stick. I'm pulling up runner. Hold it up there. Yep. Come around in a second. So okay. there's the entry, incipient phase. Okay. And now you're inverted spinning. Recovery straightforward. Okay. Power to idle, ailerons neutral, rudder opposite the spin direction. Okay. Elevator fan. Right, okay. Yeah, so, pretty straightforward. Alright, let's kill that. Oh, now it does it. Okay, flat spin. So, how do we get into a flat spin? What's, what's going to cause us to... Because you can put a, a Cessna 172 and a flat spin, a 182. What's going to cause it? Yeah, where? Forward or aft? Yeah, aft. Aft C or G, okay? That's the most common reason. If you look at it statistically over the past 25 years, all the flat spin accidents we've had with Cessna 172s, I think 90% of them have been with an aft C or G. Okay? Exactly. And the problem with a, with a flat spin in a 172, how easy is it to recover? It's not. Very hard to recover. This is the other one, keeping the power on, because what does the power do? The power brings the nose up, so it flattens the spin. Okay. Oops, come on. Prop wash, a prop down wash pushes the nose up, and we've got the gyroscopic forces as well. All right, let's see if this one works. Oh, yes. Right, flat spin. So there's the entry. See how flat that is compared to the other entry. Nose really quite high. He's having to hold it in with aileron as well. Very stable. But as soon as you put the correct recovery, it's come out. Now that's doing a flat spin in an aeroplane certified for it using the correct techniques. Okay. All right. So what? So why is the flat spin such a killer? Well, primary recovery control is the rudder with the elevator, and the airflow over the rudder is blanked by the elevator, so we don't get any, ele uh, any airflow over the elevator or, uh, or the rudder. Let's have a look. We can't change the attitude. We can't unstall the wing. There's your erect spin on the left, okay? So we're getting some airflow over the elevator, and we're getting airflow over the rudder. But look, the, the rudder is blanked in the flat spin, okay? All right. Let's have a little look. So common entry scenarios. Uh, up in the north, we call them moose stalls. Uh, in Australia, they call them roost stalls. I guess around here, you call them alligator stalls. I don't know. But it's when you're flying around low level with a buddy, and you go, oh, look. Let's have a look at that. And you start doing your turn and looking around. Okay, so all of a sudden, we're maneuvering, low level, low airspeed, and we enter a stall spin scenario. So that's the first one, moose stalls. This is by far and away the commonest, flying through the center line. Okay? As, we as we're coming in, we've got, a, we've got a, an, a wind that's pushing us through, and we fly through the center line. So what do we do? Well, we increase the angle of bank and we pull back a little bit and we're at low speed and, oh, we just stalled the aeroplane, okay? One of the best things you can teach students or one of the best things you can practice is if you fly through the center line and you think, ah, oh, that's a little bit too far. Wings level, go around. Every go around is free. First words out of my mouth when any student does a go around are, great decision. I don't care what the reason is. If they've done a go around, it's a great decision. So flying through the center line, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Simulated engine failures. Practicing turnbacks have killed more people than turnbacks have ever saved. Okay? You've got to be very confident with your altitude and your maneuvering to turn the airplane back to a field. Okay? And illicit buzzing. Not that any of us have done this, but this is another killer. Folks that go flying. Um, there's a couple of the case studies that I could have shown you. One was a private pilot student, sorry, student pilot with uh, 15 hours. He was off buzzing his girlfriend's family at a barbecue. Spun the airplane in. So when I go out to an accident site, what am I looking at? First thing, well, they're generally low speed impacts because the airplane is stalled. We're going to get a high angle of impact because the airplane is going to be coming down pretty quickly. We're going to get compact wreckage area unless there's an in-flight breakup. And we're going to get wingtip and nose damage. And I'll show you a little bit of this in a second. Potentially a fuel-starved engine if it's spun down from a long way because the, the engine hasn't managed to get the fuel because the centripetal acceleration is in the spin. And then common wreckage patterns. We're going to get a fuselage that's compressed or twisted 
and we're going to have tail section failure. So this is pretty typical. What do we see here? So he was obviously spinning to the left. Okay? So we're going to see compression damage uh, on the left wing, the nose opposite the direction of the spin. We're going to get compression damage here on the inboard section of the wing and compression damage on the outboard section here. And then impact wor um, work for the, upgo uh, the upgoing wing there. So let's have a little look. Um, I've got a, a sequence of photos. I wanted to get them in sequence, but they, it didn't work. So you're just going to look at them yourself. This is a typical one. Look, stall, stall just on, on approach. So you can see the wingtip touches the engine. The, the aircraft turns to the left, pivots to the left, and thankfully walks away. So that was a stall on final. Let's have a look at a case study then. Cessna 172. 43-year-old private pilot. So pretty low hours. He was doing a left base turn to runway 17. Okay, the wind, 12011 gusting 18. So what's that doing? That's going to push him a what year. Thankfully, with this one, he was a minor injury, which I'm amazed at when you see the wreckage. However, let's look at some of the damage we can see. The engine is cantered off to the, to the right, so it was a left-hand spin. Compression of the, of the, that, the down going wing here, compression here, and compression here and tail failure. So that, uh, and not only that, when you, when you can see it's a pretty compacted area, where's the tree? The tree's there. <laughs> it didn't do any damage to the tree. So he came down pretty straight, okay? So high vertical in impact, low speed, that looks like a spin to me, okay? So what did the pilot do? Flew through the center line, and exactly as we said, tried to correct to it. Now, there's a couple of problems here. One thing I've seen people do is, well, I, I, Scotty said that uh, stall spin accidents on final are a killer. So I'll tell you, I'm going, to, I'm going to fly my approach faster. Do it, I'm going to fly it 10 knots faster. So what happens when we turn base to final? What happens to our radius of turn now? Because we're flying faster. It's bigger. So, what, so what's the likelihood of us flying through the center line now? <laughs> so what are we going to do to get back onto the center line? <laughs> Okay, so, the, so what do we do? We just allow for wind. We've got to make sure we make co correct corrections for the wind in the pattern and try not to fly through the center line. Okay, help is out there. Angle of attack indicators. Who's flown with the angle of attack indicators in the Cessnas? Yeah, if you, get, if you get to fly with them, go have a look at them. There is a problem with them, and this is one of the problems we've got here. These are the ones that you can buy. There is no common sim symbology, so, which is a pain. So you've got to learn the symbology for your angle of attack indicator. But angle of attack indicators will certainly help you avoid stall spin accidents. Okay? So fly accurate patterns, folks. Fly the accurate pattern, allowing for the wind. Use the angle of attack if it's there. Always think energy before maneuvering, especially close to the ground. So when you're trying to do a turn back, have you got the energy? As Doc said before, what's the first thing you do with an engine failure? Lower the nose. Keep your energy high. Gives you options. And rethink how we teach stalls. Remember, the object is to recognize and prevent the stall from happening. Are there any questions? If you can't read it, it says, I, can't, I keep telling you, I can't turn the other engine on until I get a multi-engine license. <laughs> okay. Right, just before I go, Doc mentioned crosswinds. I'm going to take you through a, a quick two-second Scotty's top tip on how to calculate crosswinds in your head. Who can calculate crosswinds, crosswind components in your head? Yeah, you can. You just don't know it. Right. There's the aeroplane. Where has the wind got to be coming from to give us the maximum crosswind? It's not 90 degrees. So either, either way, okay? Actually, if you do the math, it's anywhere within 30 degrees of that is pretty much maximum crosswind, okay? So that leaves us with zero crosswind on the head of the aeroplane going around to maximum crosswind 60 degrees off the wing, Okay? So what we need is some way of easily being able to have an analogy in our head that we can use to give us this 60, 60 somethings in something. Anybody, any ideas? What about that one? Stopwatch. Everybody remember a stopwatch, the old coach's stopwatch? Okay. How about this? We've got a runway. So northern runway, the wind is 0, 3, 0 at 20 knots. What's the crosswind? It's not about 10. It is 10. How do we know? 30 degrees, change it to 30 seconds of our stopwatch, okay? 30 seconds is half of our stopwatch. So half the wind 
is 10 knots. Don't believe me? Well, let's have a look. There's the, there's the, there's the component graph. 30 degrees. 20 knots. Can't, couldn't get the, the graphics to work properly, but there you go. 20 knots. Takes it down. 10 knots. Let's try another one. 240 at 30. What's the crosswind? Well, it's 40 degrees off. Nope. 40 degrees. Change it to 40 seconds of our stopwatch. What proportion of our stopwatch is that? 40 seconds, two-thirds. 40 seconds, two-thirds of our stopwatch, two-thirds of the wind is 20 knots. Don't believe me? 40 degrees, 30 knots, 20 knot crosswind component. You can do that in your head, sat at the end of the runway. You can do it any time you get a wind check and you get your crosswind component in your head. It takes one second to do. Okay? Um, but it's a really, really quick, easy way of working out what the crossing component is. Okay? And you can use the same technique to work out drift angles. You can ask me about that another time. Any questions on anything I went through there, guys? So 15 degrees is 15, uh, 15 degrees crosswind. Would be a quarter. Would be a quarter, so it's a quarter of the crosswind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, easy, isn't it? Yeah. Any other questions? Perfect. Thanks for your time, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.